Welcome to Sabbath School brought to you by It Is Written. I'm Eric Flickinger and we are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, looking today at lesson number 12, Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom. And our guest today is Dr. Felix Cortez. He is the Associate Professor of New Testament Literature at Andrews University. Pastor Felix, we are very nearly at the end of our 13 studies together. Welcome. It's, it has been a pleasure to be with you. So we are pulling things together now. We're, we're almost there. We've got one lesson left. And here in lesson number 12, we're going to spend the bulk of our time in Hebrews chapter 12. And it's a fascinating chapter. Pulls a lot of things together about what it is that God has in store for us. We've talked about uh, Christ being our priest. We've talked about him being our creator. Uh, he is our mediator. We talked about the importance of sacrifices and gifts. We've come a long, long way. And now we're getting to chapter 12 in this unshakable kingdom that is referred to. I want to read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So what is this unshakable kingdom that's being described here? Well, this unshakable kingdom, uh, the author of Hebrews is describing, is the kingdom promised in Daniel 2, in Daniel 7. Um, God said that uh, God showed to Nebuchadnezzar a, a statue that represented the history, the future of the world. There was the head that represented Babylon, the chest that represented Medo-Persia, and you know, the, uh, the other parts, Greece and Rome, and then there was going to come a, a stone cut without hand. And this stone was going to destroy this, and it was going to be a kingdom that will remain forever, will never be shaken, will never be destroyed. That is the kingdom we're talking about. In fact, if you go to, to, to the scholars of Hebrews, I'm talking about non-Adventist scholars, will recognize that Hebrews 12.28 has a verbal parallelism with Daniel 7, 18 and 23, where it says that the saints of the Most High will receive a kingdom, kingdom that will never be destroyed. And what we have here is that we, which are the, ser the servants of the Most High, the, 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 the saints of the Most High, will receive a kingdom that will never be shaken. So they recognize that this language here is language taken from Daniel 7. And what Hebrews has in mind is that we are going to receive the promises of God made in this beautiful prophecy that we hold dear to our hearts as Adventists. The promise of Daniel 7, the promise of Daniel 8, and, 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 and you know, the, uh, the fulfillment of God's purposes for humanity. So a prophecy given 2,500 years ago hasn't fallen flat. In fact, we've seen the rise and fall of the, all of those different empires, those kingdoms that you mentioned, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, the divided nations of Europe. And now we're getting to the point where the fulfillment of the prophecy about the rock, the establishment of Christ's kingdom that will never be destroyed is, is actually going to come to pass. In Hebrews 12, going back just a few verses before verse 28, it begins in verse number 22 where he says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. It would seem to me that if this kingdom is going to be received, this would be cause for celebration. And here we see in verse number 22 that an innumerable company of angels is involved in this celebration. How big is this celebration? Well, this is really a big celebration. Uh, you have innumerable angels. I remember here the, uh, the Greek uh, uh, expression, which is thousands, ten thousands of ten thousands angels. This is a big number. And what is happening here? Um, what is happening here is 
the celebration for the enthronement of Jesus after his ascension. He ascended to heaven and God said, he's my righteous son. He is able to... This is what is described in Revelation 4 and 5. Who is worthy to take the scroll? The scroll, only the king could do that. Now the, 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 the son, the lion of the tribe of Judah, has, has uh, become a victorious king so he can sit at, uh, uh, in the throne. So you have this celebration for the, uh, for the beginning of Jesus' uh, kingdom. That's what you have there. Now, this celebration, Eric, is just the previous celebration for a greater celebration, which is the second coming. It is the celebration when we, again, in the presence of thousands of angels, uh, we're going to come into the presence of God. It is going to be the moment when God gives the welcome to Adam who lost the place. Every angel wants to see that, wants to see that. When the first Adam and the second, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, they meet and they embrace this is going to be amazing to see. It's a time when this family that has been away for so long a time, that has been separated from God for so much time, is now embracing the middle of God. That is the moment of celebration. So what happened at the Ascension is just the pre, pre-party of what is going to be the last party, the big one, right? This is, this is amazing what is happening here. So this is a prelude to what is to come. And, and this celebration seems big enough as it is. It is. And yet the one that comes later is going to be even larger, even more impressive. Yeah. And yet even in, even in this, this celebration, there's an interesting element here that comes out in verse 23. It talks about the innumerable company of angels in verse 22, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. So there's an element of judgment that's here as well. How does that fit in? It does perfectly. The problem is that for us, it doesn't, uh, because for us, judgment is like bad news. But in the Old Testament, the New Testament, judgment is what everyone is expecting. The, the, the righteous is expecting judgment. Do you remember a revelation where it says, you have this, how long God, and you're going to judge us. We need you to judge us. Because in the Old Testament, the judge raises to defend the, those who have been abused. Defends the poor. So the, the Christian says, God, how long before judgment comes? And then in, in Revelation 14, you have these angels. And, and these angels have the, the gospel, the good news. And what are the good news? that the hour of the judgment has come. This judgment is what you find in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, you have a judgment because the people of God has been trampled, has been persecuted, has been, has been really badly abused by this little horn and the forces of evil. And, and then comes a judgment in which God vindicates them. God releases them. And God, the judgment is in their favor. So the coming of the judgment predicted in Daniel 7 is really big news for us. So it's, it's not a judgment or an element of fear here, but it's celebration of vindication that, uh, that finally justice is done. And I think really that's what a lot of people, most people, everybody perhaps wants today is that justice will be done. And another part of this here, down just a few more verses in verse number 26, it says, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. So here he's shaking the earth and heaven. Why is that important to us? Well, you see, if you go to the Old Testament, the shaking is one of the signs of the judgment of God or the day of the Lord. When the Lord appeared to, to, to deliver his people, to defend his people, or sometimes to judge them, this, uh, this day of the Lord was 
very often accompanied by a shaking of the earth, okay? And what is happening here is that there is a judgment and there is a shaking. There's an image of judgment. Now, if you go to the Old Testament, you're going to find that there is one type of persons who are not shaken. The righteous is not shaken. The person who takes, who makes God his, uh, his, his strength is not shaken. So those who are not shaken are the people of God. Right. And that's why they are waiting for this, because they are going to be finally delivered from these forces of, of evil. Now, another thing that I want to say is that if you go to Hebrews, if you go to Hebrews 10, verse 30, um, you're going to find uh, a, an interesting expression there. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When we read this passage, we think that judgment is a fearful thing. Yes, judgment, it is a fearful thing for the enemies of God. But that's why several versions translate this passage not as God will judge his people, but God will vindicate his people. So this passage really is not a fearful thing for us, really is a welcome thing for the people of God, because God is going to come to vindicate them through a legal process and make their salvation secure forever. So vindication sounds a whole lot better to us than, than judgment does, and I think appropriately so. Because when we look at the world today, we see a lot of injustice, we see a lot of inequality. In fact, much of the dissatisfaction, much of the unrest that we see in society today is because many people sense a lack of, of justice, a lack of fairness, uh, that, that things aren't necessarily going their way when, when maybe they ought to. And yet ultimately, Jesus says he is going to judge his people, he is going to vindicate his people, he's going to make things right, finally. As you read just a moment ago there, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Sometimes we're tempted to try to take things out and make things right today by ourselves in our own power. And unfortunately, that's always not always possible. But the good news is there is a day coming when Jesus is going to set everything right when Jesus is going to right every wrong, a day of justice is coming, a day of vengeance where God takes care of things is coming. And ultimately, you and I, by the grace of God, can and will be vindicated. That day is coming very, very soon. And it's part of what we're looking at here in uh, the book of Hebrews chapter 12. We're gonna continue digging into this section of the book of Hebrews in just a moment. But I want to remind you, we're getting down to the very end of our time together studying the book of Hebrews. If you have enjoyed it, if you have gained something from it, I want to encourage you once again to pick up that companion volume to the book of Hebrews. You will find it in the, in the It Is Written shop, itiswritten.shop. Pick it up there, read it, delve into it, dive into it, study it, and you're going to find a beautiful picture of Jesus in its pages. We're going to come back in just a moment as we continue looking at the book of Hebrews in our 12th lesson of 13. We'll be right back. More and more people are watching It Is Written TV. They're watching their favorite It Is Written programs, listening to inspiring sermon series, and much more. They're watching them here, here, and even here. See for yourself why people are turning to It Is Written TV to watch their favorite Christian programs live and on demand. Watch It Is Written TV for free anytime on Roku, Apple TV, and at itiswritten.tv. Welcome back to Sabbath School. We are taking a look at lesson number 12 here. And Pastor Felix, you mentioned something just before we took a break about there being a couple of different shakings. Could you explain those just a little bit more clearly? There is a very interesting comparison that we find in this chapter. If you go to verses 18, 19, and 20, Hebrews 12, it says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness, and darkness, and tempest, 
and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, if it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow, and so terrifying was a sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. So you have there a, a scene of what happened with the people of Israel before Mount Sinai when the uh, Ten Commandments were, uh, were given, even though this specific passage is referring in Deuteronomy to something that happened later on in the second in the second appearance or, or in a second appearance before God in the mountain uh, after the first one in, in Exodus 19. But what this, what, what, this, what is happening here is the frightfulness, the frightful nature of the people encountering God. The, the mountain shook. There was thunder. There was a tempest. There was a loud sound, and people were frightened. No one could approach the, the, the mountain. And, um, and what the apostle is saying, you know, your approach to the heavenly Zion is not going to be like that. Your approach to the heavenly Zion is going to be very different. It's going to be a feast, a, a, an, in, an innumerable angels gathering in, in, festa, in festivities. It's going to be completely opposite. So you have these two, two contrasts. And these two contrasts, uh, two shakings, the shaking in, in Sinai, now the shaking is that it's hoping to happen in the future. In Sinai, people felt they shouldn't feel like that, but they felt that they were being judged and, and that they were, they were terrified from God because they didn't, didn't trust. In fact, God wanted the people to come up the mountain with him. When you go to Deuteronomy 5, the first 10 verses, you're going to find Moses explaining to the people, you didn't want to come up the mountain because God wanted. Yes, the first three days, they were going to, to wait in the border of the mountain. But after the three days, God's purpose was that they were going to up with him. He brought them to myself, says God. The people didn't believe. They stayed afar. They, 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 they said to Moses, you know, we're not going, we're going to die. You go, you are our representative. This separation between them and God was the first problem. But, but God, is going, God, is, God is saying, this, not, this is not going to be like this the second time. You are coming to a, a, a gathering, a festivity. That is an important thing. But I think there is a deeper element here. And the deeper element is that when Jesus came to this earth, there was already a shaking of a mountain. Now, this mountain is not Sinai. This mountain is Calvary. When Jesus cried in the, uh, in the cross, it is finished. Matthew 27 says that there was a big earthquake so that tombs were opened. And, and, and um, it was a very terrifying scene. But that moment was a moment in which our judgment, Jesus said in John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world is being cast out. So this is the moment in which God decided our case. And God decided our case in Jesus. Everyone who believes in Jesus is now saved, it is, 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 is being brought into Myself. Therefore, the, the veil of the temple is open because we have now access. That is the judgment that happened there. So in that sense, that is also a first trembling. The second trembling where the second aspect of the judgment where we are going to be vindicated in order to come to the presence of God now personally, bodily, physically, is still a, uh, in the future in the, from the point of view of Hebrews. But these are the two shakings that we find in, in, this, in this chapter. So no reason for us to fear today. Assuming that we are right with God, you know, that we're not living in rebellion to him or something like that, nothing to fear here whatsoever. In fact, he's trying to encourage us and let us know that we will indeed have our cases vindicated. Now, in speaking of shakings and things that shake and things that don't shake, what we looked at when we began today's lesson was this unshakable kingdom here in verse 28 again. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. 
So this, this kingdom that can't be shaken, it's going to stay around forever. What else do we know about this unshakable kingdom that can give us some encouragement? Well, there are many things. Revelation 1 and Revelation 5 says that we have been made kings and priests and we will reign with him. Hebrews 20, sorry, Revelation 20 says that we will reign with him uh, for a thousand years. What is the meaning of that? Is that, you see, Revelation 3, 20 says that whoever, um, whoever overcomes, I will, I will make him sit at my, uh, with me in my throne as I share the throne of my father. What is the meaning of this? Is that incredibly enough, um, Eric, we are going to be able to judge um, uh, together with Jesus. First Corinthians 6 says that we're going to judge the angels. We're going to judge the evil angels. We're going to judge Satan, the one who tempted us. We're going to judge them. It's an incredible thing that is going to happen in, in, the, um, in the end during that 1,000 years. So that is part of the unshakable kingdom that we are receiving, the ability to judge. Now, I wanted to say something, Eric, about a little more about this unshakable kingdom. If you go to Psalms 15, verse 5, let me read this psalm. He says, He who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent, he who does these things shall never be moved. The original Hebrew says, shall never be shaken. If you go to Psalm 16, verse 8, uh, just a few verses later says, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So the original meaning of this verse in Psalm 16, 8 is the one that is righteous before God because he has put the Lord before, before him. He believes in him. He shall not be moved, meaning he shall not be shaken. Basically, it is an unshakable kingdom because it is, compri it, it is comprised of unshakable people. People that cannot be shaken. Why they cannot be shaken? Because they are righteous. Why they are righteous? Because they have put Jesus before them. Because they believe in Jesus. If the trunk, which is Jesus, cannot be shaken, shaken the branches which we are, we will not be shaken. So this is part of this unshakable kingdom. And, um, and this provides a lot of encouragement for us. If we believe in Jesus and we embrace him and we put him before us and we follow him, we will be part of this kingdom that will last forever. So being a part of this kingdom that shall last forever, we don't deserve to be a part of it. We haven't done anything to really earn it, if you will, but we do have access to it. We have access to, to it in the future, and we also have access to a very strong, a very powerful relationship with Jesus today. And in verse 28, we're given a description of the way that we ought to respond to this incredible gift. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So this natural response that should come from us as a result of being so grateful for what God has given us that we don't deserve, he says, let us, serve, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. There's a way that we can respond. Yes, and a response, let us have grace, means let us be grateful. Let us give thanks, other person says. Let us be grateful to God. Now, let me, let me say something more here. We believers, Adventist believers, know that before Jesus comes, there is going to be something called the pre-Advent judgment. And sometimes we are afraid, what is going to happen in this pre-Advent judgment? Are we going to be judged before God? And we have this image of being in front of God alone with the Ten Commandments and, 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 and our lives is going to be scrutinized. And what is going to happen there? But I found that there is an, uh, a description of, of, 
of the judgment in a different sense, that I, an illustration that could help us understand what is happening here. Um, you know, I'm a professor and I guide dissertations as well for PhD students, uh, master's students. And uh, I told them that if they follow my instructions, I'm going to make sure that they are successful in judgment. What is the judgment? It's the day of the defense. When you have all this panel of five experts, some external examiners that go through your dissertation, ask you questions and try to find out whether you are ready. Uh, this is the day of judgment for students. I told them, if you follow my instructions, we're going to do well. Why? Because since I am the advisor, I am also being judged. How well did the advisor do his job? Did he prepare them well? Did he guide them well? So I do all the best possible for them to be ready. And in fact, I do not allow a person to come into defense if that dissertation or thesis is not ready. I, want to be, I don't want to be put to shame. I, I want to wait until everything is ready. Because I, my, my, uh, you know, my reputation is also on the line. So the day of judgment is when a student does what I, what I told him to do and we work together, I put the, my best suit and I told the student, come prepare because this is a celebration. Everyone will know what I already know. And what, is, what do I already know? That this is a good dissertation. This is a good thesis. I want everybody to know. And this is what God does. God brings all his people and says, I want everyone to know what has happened in the life of this person. I have it ready. And I think there will be a lot of standing ovations for God in the pre-advent judgment. And he's going to lead us when we are ready. He's going to say, you're ready. Now is the time for judgment for you. Because he has invested a lot in us. Also, his reputation is on the line. We, if we go with him, he will be greatly exalted. And we are going to enjoy that, that, uh, that kingdom that he has for us. Friends, that is an encouraging message. Jesus wants to prepare you for that great day. And he can prepare you for that great day. All we have to do is be willing. Pastor Felix, thank you once again for joining us. We have one more week together as we come together to conclude our 13th and final lesson on the book of Hebrews. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.